round table, well, more like a conversation between Professor Penny Green, the director of the International State Crime Initiative at Queen Mary University of London, and um, you know, um, very distinguished uh, UN Special Envoy, uh, former envoy on uh, on these situations of human rights in Myanmar from 19, sorry, 2008 to 20. 13. So Mr. Quintana comes with five years of solid um, experience on the issue of um, human rights abuses by the state and non-state actors. But in this case, he will be focusing on the um, specific state-directed and uh, popular racism against uh, Rohingya people in Rakhine State. Uh, that, you know, he will distinguish there are two different types of abuses. Uh, one is towards the general Muslim populations. There are 16 or so different uh, Muslim communities scattered across the country. And, but particularly the persecution, which some of us call as a genocide, slow burning genocide, slow genocide, is most acute. And that is the subject of his, uh, or continues to be the subject of his concern. So let me just start um, by asking Professor Penny Green. You know, we have seen thousands of boats or thousands of refugees, not migrants. They're not fleeing from um, poor country, lack of development. Um, they're not fleeing from just general racism that we see in liberal democracy, even you know places like the United States. You know. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe, but they are fleeing from extremely dire human conditions. And in, in your uh, forthcoming uh, uh, research report that you've conducted with two of your colleagues, um, including fieldwork in Bangladesh and Burma, and particularly Rakhine State, can you describe the kind of conditions that these people, including nine months old babies, are fleeing from? And why in your independent essay published on the 20th of May, did you use the word genocide to describe the situation? Uh, thanks, Zani. Um, yes, I think that the field work that we've conducted over the, well, it was four and a half months of intensive field work in Burma um, and particularly most of the time in Rakhine State. And uh, our, our findings are such as to make the um, uh, the decision that what's going on inside Burma is a genocide are absolutely, for us, um, absolutely conclusive. Um, we think that the evidence uh, that what we are witnessing in terms of the stigmatization, the isolation, the harassment, and now uh, the stage of systematic weakening tells us that we are in a process of genocide. Now we have to understand, I think, Zani, that genocide is not the act simply of mass annihilation. It's not simply when um, hundreds of thousands of people are killed. Genocide is a process. It takes place across many years, decades in this case. It's the exclusion, the isolation, the harassment of the, and the dehumanization of the Rohingya indigenous community in Burma has been taking place for many decades. But in 2012, we saw a change. The violence which was perpetrated against the Rohingya um, in Rakhine State in June and October of 2012 marked a new development in this very disturbing process. And following the violence, um, we saw Rohingya communities pushed into absolutely horrendous living conditions in camps, in a camp complex where they are denied the right uh, to move, to travel, the right to earn a livelihood. They are denied basic food, adequate food provisions. They're denied um, emergency health care. And basically, they're denied ordinary health care. They're dying from absolutely treatable diseases. Um, and when we visited the camps and the villages in Sitwe, around Sitwe uh, region, we were horrified by the, um, the circumstances in which people are forced to live. 
they are living what we would call an absolutely bare existence, a bare life, denied of all human rights. Uh, we see, we, we, you know, the, 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 the physical illnesses which we observed, the, ab the obvious depression, the blankness in people's eyes. Um, for us, what is happening to the Rohingya is a genocide. Um, Tomas, um, you joined us at the London School of Economics back in April uh, last year uh, by Skype from Argentina or Chile. And um, you used the word in your then official capacity as the special repertoire on the human rights situation in Myanmar. I quote you, you said, in the case of Rohingya, there are elements of genocide. Let me repeat elements of a genocide, and, unquote. And can you say more about that, you know, in, in the context where we heard from George Soros, who as a Jewish teenager at the age of 15 fled Budapest under Nazi occupation, visited Almengala, visited Rakhine State, and said he heard the echoes of his childhood and he used the word ghetto, and he compared the, um, the, the conditions on the ground and um, with his life experiences as a Jew. He called himself, I, I was a Rohingya in 1944. Um, can you elaborate why you use the word elements of genocide? And can you relate that to what we heard today from Mr. Soros' testimony? All right, yes, I can. Um, first, let me have one minute to thank you for this invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to, to see many human rights advocates, fighters, uh, even victims whom I met uh, in prison in the past, in Situé and in some other prisons, and now I see them here uh, really in freedom, and that that's makes, uh, I think, us uh, very happy. Um, I hold the, the Myanmar, Ma Myanmar mandate for six years, actually, until uh, June 2014, one year ago. Um, and I visited the country many times. Uh, I traveled all over the country. And it, it, I visited Rakhine four times. And I've been in Butidong, Mongdo, and Situé, and all around uh, that state. Uh, and uh, I get to know uh, in close detail the situation of the Rohingya community. The first visit was in 2009. Uh, I didn't know the situation of, of you people, the Rohingya, there. Uh, I remember I went to Mongdo. Uh, it was a visit guided by the government, of course, because uh, the reporters we are appointed by the Human Rights Council. We need to try to engage with the authorities, to talk to the ministers, to listen to them, and try to build a dialogue. And then, afterwards, try to bring results, improvements of the human rights situation. But at that time, I remember uh, I, uh, in Mongdo, I met um, a group of Rohingya leaders. And in 2009, they were, they were frightened to meeting the human rights reporter going to Mongdo. And I remember we were in a room, supposedly to be a private room, um, and I asked them, do you consider yourselves as Rohingya leaders? And they couldn't respond to that because of the fear that the government was listening to them. So that was in two, back in 2009, and then suddenly made me under look in more detail about the situation of the, of the Rohingya. I w went back to the area uh, some other times. And uh, finally, in 2014, in March, to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, I presented a report where I drew a, where I drew a conclusion and I said that the situation of the Rohingyas in Myanmar um, entail uh, the category of crimes against humanity according to the Rome Statute. And I called the Human Rights Council to address the issue. Well, nothing happened from the Human Rights Council of the United Nations in this respect. By that time, 
uh, the situation uh, as, as Penny was uh, describing was escalating in terms of violence, the 2012 violence, which caused a lot of uh, uh, deaths from, uh, f f from the Rohingya community, of course, from the Rakhine community. When I, go, when I went to, to Rakhine State, I always meet uh, the Rakhine community, trying to listen to their grievances, their concerns, um, and they were also victims from the Rakhine side as well. Um, now, the reaction from the government, which we do not need to forget that this is a government which comes from the 2010 election, which was not, not a, f a free and fair election at all, and the international community didn't endorse those elections. A government uh, whose um, members, many of them, come from the former military regime. I used to meet the current Minister of Immigration in the past as a chief of police of Myanmar. King. Yeah, the chief of police who was in charge of the repression of the Saffron Revolution against monks. And this authority now is the Minister of Immigration. And of course, the president, the current president of Myanmar used to be the Prime Minister of Tan Shui. So, uh, we don't need to forget this. Um, and what happened is that suddenly this new government started to build some progress in some areas of human rights. I mean, I'm talking about the release of political prisoners, something that we all welcomed was very important. I met many of these political prisoners in prison and then I met them in freedom. That's important. We need to recognize that. The opening of the media very important, and some other progress. But what happened in Rakhine State was something in the opposite side. The government, instead of improving the situation in Rakhine State of the Rohingya, do all the contrary. And the government enhanced all the policies of persecution against the Rohingya community. And this started with this new quasi-civilian government which the theory says that genocides come from dictatorships or authoritarian governments, not from democratic governments. Well, that's what I'm saying. We don't need to forget that this is a quasi-civilian government. And that's why the situation in Rakhine State is um, getting worse. That's why um, uh, after my report in 2014, when I detected crimes against humanity being committed in Myanmar, in Rakhine State against Rohingya, I started to look into the question of genocide. And I continue to do that. Now, I have to make a clarification. I am no longer the special reporter for the situation of human rights in Myanmar. I am not talking to you at this moment in my, my capacity as an appointed expert from the United Nations. We all know that it's a new reporter, Mrs. Jiang Yili. She's a very respectful <coughs> expert committed to the human rights in Myanmar. I'm going, I'm going to talk to you as an independent expert in the past and as an independent expert now. And, I'm and I started to look into the question of genocide and trying to make some research. And I found an interesting approach during the Rwanda tribunal. And there was this lawyer, he was an Amer African-American lawyer, and I, his name is Pierre Prospect. And he was trying to build the question of genocide in relation to the use of rape. So, in Rwanda. So, he started, he's a lawyer, I am a lawyer myself, he started to look into the one word which is in the convention for the prevention and punishment of genocide, of the crime of genocide, which is destruction, destroy. What is the meaning of destruction of a community? Is the Rohingya community being destroyed at this moment by the Myanmar government? Destroy means mass killing, only mass killing, extermination, elimination, 
Well, what this lawyer um, argued before the Rwanda Tribunal was that destruction doesn't mean exactly that. And he says, a group could, post, a group could physically still exist or escape extermination, but be left so marginalized or so irrelevant to society that it was, in effect, destroyed. And the tribunal accepted this term and convicted the Rwanda military for genocide in this respect. So this is a good example. And uh, according to this uh, reasoning, we can say today the Rohingya community is in process of genocide, as Penny pointed out. Do you want to follow up on that? Um, yes, and I think that's a really interesting um, um, <clears throat> example from Rwanda. And it's certainly, um, I think we can get very hung up on the convention. And I think that there are other ways of looking and understanding genocide, not least that we observe the genocidal practices that have taken place um, you know, um, with the Holocaust in Cambodia and in Rwanda. And we can learn by benchmarking, if you like, what we're seeing and witnessing in Rakhine State, in Burma, against the processes which took place in Cambodia, in Germany, and in Rwanda. And on that basis, our research suggests, as I said, very strongly that what we are witnessing, as Thomas also said, is a genocidal process. We are in the middle of it. In fact, we are at the stage before mass annihilation, if we use Daniel Fierstein's work. Uh, and and that, that stage which my colleagues Alicia and Tom are going to talk about this afternoon is all about breaking a community, reducing it to the barest of existences. And so, yes, I, I absolutely endorse uh, the idea that, that what we are witnessing is a genocide. And of course, for political communities, that's a very difficult word to accept because it places an obligation on them in law to act, to do something. Otherwise, they are, in fact, complicit. But I wanted to ask you, Thomas, um, question really about the United Nations too. I mean, when we were conducting our research in Rakhine State, we uh, came across um, UN workers who weren't sure how to describe what they were witnessing. It was as if they were waiting for some kind of directive from the United Nations. Um, do you think they're going to receive any such directive? Well, that's a um, difficult question to respond because who is, when you say the United Nations order or instruction, what are we thinking about? Who are we thinking about? Mm. Is it the Security Council? Is it the Human Rights Council? Is it the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon? Or some other uh, uh, body from the United Nations? Well, this is the challenge mm. for the civil society who has been pushing for this recognition for those NGOs who have presented evidences mm. to reach this assumption. Uh, we know about many reports from Human Rights Watch, Fortify Rights, and some others who shows us a sophistication of the policies of this government of Myanmar towards <coughs> compromising the existence of the Rohingya community very sophisticated articulation of policies which we need to, 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 um, to, to find out how it works to, to read these conclusions. Now, um, the, the, the United Nations has many bodies. You have UNHCR working on the ground trying to help the Rohingya community, OCHA, uh, the World Fruit Program and some others. Um, these bodies will not address this kind of substantive conclusion. I believe, this is my opinion, this is the responsibility first of the Human Rights Council, which has this mandate to address this kind of systematic human rights violations, which includes crimes against humanity and genocide. And it is, of course, for the, human, uh, uh, for the Security Council also the responsibility to address this, which the Security Council did it in the past for example, in the case of Rwanda or Darfur, uh, where the situation was only internal, uh, did not compromise 
the peace and security among different states. But, this, uh, uh, but uh, however, that the, the criminal security council addressed the issue um, and, and, and take some action. So um, I think that uh, the, the, there is a need to develop different strategies toward the United Nations. Uh, it could be, as again, the Human Rights Council, it could be the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who is playing a very active role in respect to human rights uh, all over the world. It can be the special procedures. Uh, Mrs. Jang Lee, I think she's playing a very important role, but other reporters can also participate uh, uh, in a discussion about the situation of the Rohingyas. We can, for example, expect or ask for a joint report of different human rights reporters, including the turtle reporter, the IDP reporter, <coughs> the uh, right to food, etc., yes. etc., and Jan Gili as well. No, I mean, on, on that point, in fact, we are in communication with Hilal Elva, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who is very concerned about the way in which food is being used as a weapon against the, the Rohingya. And I think that's, that is a very important way in, to pool the resources of the Special Rapporteurs to um, highlight, highlight this particular issue. One of the concerns that, that, that we have, have found, and I'd be very interested in both your opinions on, on this, is that when we take the case of apartheid in South Africa or the apartheid in, in Palestine, Israel at the moment, we can rely very strongly on organised civil society in those countries to work with them. And in fact, it, the ANC was calling for the boycott in South Africa. Um, and Palestinians equally are calling for a, a boycott of Israeli goods and, 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 and corporations and so on. This is much harder in the case of Burma. In, in fact, in other research which my team and I have been conducting with civil society activists inside the country, one of the things that struck us was that despite the fact that these people had endured perhaps 15, 20 years inside Burma's jails under the dictatorship, <coughs> they were unable to recognize the human rights crisis experienced by the Rohingya. They were in effect buying the line that uh, the Rohingya were illegal immigrants and somehow didn't demand their attention as citizens of the country. I mean, of course, they're not formal citizens, but it, it, that, that to us was quite a shocking finding. But it also has implications for the way in which we move forward. And I wondered if I could um, have your opinions on, on this. Well, um, all of you who work in Myanmar know about this. How difficult it is to raise the Rohingya issue with different sta stakeholders working on Myanmar, including other ethnic minority groups. Now, what we can do in this respect is to point out that they are wrong, or we can also try to understand them, or we can do both. My, my humble opinion is that Myanmar has been under military regime for 40 years. People from Myanmar learned violence from the military who oppressed the people for 40 years. This is something that we need to remind because it's a way to understand the stances, this kind of dif difficult stances to understand from, from, from these different stakeholders. Um, the other issue is that there is a, in Myanmar a culture of impunity one of the, my opinion is, one of the mistakes from the international community today, the Nor Norwegian authorities were talking to us about how they engage with the government, etc. But one of the mistakes from the international community as a whole is the lack of um, accountability, the call for accountability for crimes being committed in the country, all over the country. So, uh, if, the, if, the, if you don't have a culture against impunity, then you, we constantly 
find yourself before these kind of situations, like in Rakhine State, where crimes have been committed and there is no accountability. But also we see this in the situation the Lepadon copper mine. We see this in, in, in ethnic minority areas, clashes between the government, army, and ethnic armed groups, where the civilians are found themselves in the middle of the bullets and suffering the consequences. And there is no accountability. So this, these are, this, this is a other element that make us understand why this stakeholder has this kind of position. And the third one, and I'm finished with this, is the current political dynamics towards the 2015 elections. And I want to say something about that. No, I, I want to uh, return to the question of um, the role of the state. You know, there has been a lot uh, discussed or uh, you know, broadcast or analyzed about the role of extremist Buddhist monks. You know, there's no, I mean, it's a term in contradiction. Buddhism is about middle path. You know, we call it Mizima um, you know, The extremism doesn't have a place in the Buddhist epistemology. So, and then the other question is uh, the other issue is the persecution or the violence, mm. mass violence against Rohingyas has been misframed as a result of an, uh, you know, inevit an almost inevitable, you know, if unfortunate aspect of authoritarian multi-ethnic societies opening up. You know, I, I, my colleague Ellis and I conducted three years, you know, consecutive study involving fee works. I cannot go to Burma. She can. She did. And I, but I have access to uh, some of the um, um, ex-high-ranking military officials. I came from an extended military family. And one of the reasons I'm sitting here today is, uh, is personal. Because the people who are centrally involved in this genocidal process are my old friends. Family friends, say for instance, uh, you know, after I learned that there was a group in our country, I lived in Burma for 25 years, but I never heard the word genocide mentioned or, or, or like, you know, in the state media or in, you know, social conversation anywhere in the world. But, I, you know, I thought they were just <laughs> illegal migrants, you know, from Bang Bangladesh. And, uh, but when I learned um, that there was a group, and they are our own people, because they share a birthplace with all the rest of us. Although I am Buddhist, um, you know, I embrace them. And um, it turned out that the person who put me on the plane as a young student at the age of 24 in 1988, going to California, was the security chief of Rakhine State. He was my father's college best friend. And, and then Joy in line. Yeah, Myanmar Peace Center, which no wave uh, funds and supports and thinks it's a very, uh, uh, it's an institution with the integrity, is, you know, one of my oldest friends in U.S. as students. And he was like my younger brother. And he was, he is considered to be someone behind the Rakhine Action Plan that has been compared with, you know, maybe in an exaggerated fashion, the, the final solution, the Burmese way. And then the current Rakhine minister, ex-Major General Ma Ma Oon. I knew him when he was 19. He was my, my, my best friend's middle brother. So this is not just simply a theoretical or academic issue. And um, so you talk about the strategies that they use and the sophistication. I have had conversations with the military officers posted in Rakhine State in one of the papers that we published, you know, that, that, that bear the title, The Slow Burning Genocide of Myanmar's uh, Rohingya. He told me, having over a cup of coffee, he was an ambassador in one of the Southeast Asian nations. He thought he, I was one of, like one of them. He said, brother, there are too many of them. We cannot kill them all. So, you know, the, that is the genocidal discourse. You know, in the 21st century, high-ranking military of officials thought it you know, okay to say that we want to wipe them out, but it's impractical to kill them all. So how do you address the issue, the central instrumental role of 
officials at the highest level and the, the state. And then finally, the impunity that you mentioned isn't just impunity at the highest level over the lower ranks committing all kinds of atrocities against Rakhine. And I would argue that what we are seeing is a double impunity where genocide is allowed to unfold in an excru excruciatingly slow manner. International impunity is there. Therefore, we have a situation where agencies such as UNHCR would not address the fundamental issue of international crime being committed against the Rohingya. We have a government like Norway that portrays Rohingya situation as a byproduct um, of an extreme poverty. We have a situation where the largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia, would say this is an unfortunate aspect of Burma opening up. We must encourage. How do you, how do you try to stop this kind of slow genocide that is not called by its name, that, you know, where genociders enjoy double impunity? Well, this is, this is kind of an answer. And this conference, we can call it a clear early warning against the genocide in Myanmar. Yes, and I think, I think one of the things that we have to guard against is actually the humanitarian mentality because we have a crisis in the Andaman Sea, that's where the attention is focused. But we have to make sure in our positions to redirect people's attention to the fact that this, this, this crisis has root causes and it has root causes inside Burma, Myanmar. It has root causes in the worst form of state crime, a genocidal practice that is taking place here and now. And if we don't do something very soon, there will be no Rohingya as an, as a, as an ethnic minority, and we have to act. But it's very important, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's very important that we <coughs> move away from, we, we, that we challenge the humanitarian discourse. And that also applies inside Burma, because we interviewed many people working for humanitarian organizations doing very good work, you know, attempting to take food into the camps to, to look after the interests of the Rohingya to a, to a limited extent because, of course, they are denied um, access to the Rohingya in many respects. And certainly we, we saw the expulsion of Medicine, Medicine Sans Frontieres. And as a result of that expulsion, we also witnessed what we saw as a chilling effect on all other international NGOs in the region because, of course, humanitarianism is an industry and people uh, have jobs as a result of that industry. And they want to stay in Burma, Myanmar, almost regardless. So what we're finding is that they aren't prepared to stand up and say, uh, what we are witnessing is a genocide. What we are witnessing is the most appalling crime, acts of, of criminality against this indigenous minority. And so I think that we do have to be very careful and we have to critique the humanitarian discourse because you could argue, and I think it's a valid argument, that humanitarianism is contributing to the continuing existence of the persecution. Uh, it's continuing to keep people in um, absolutely horrendous conditions in camps and villages in Rakhine State. Um, a limited amount of food enabling people to eke out a very bare existence maintains a, a, a facade that this is simply a humanitarian crisis. It's not. It's a state crime of the worst order, and we have to do something about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Although uh, I, I don't know if I would agree to that extent, Penny, uh, in respect to, to the to humanitarian workers. Uh, I remember meeting, meeting in Butidong, um, uh, local UN, UNHCR workers who were detained, tortured in Butidong and, uh, and, uh, and I respect their work and I'm sure you, you too. But I want to say three quick things. One is that um, there is a formula that is being repeated by many people and I did it, I also repeated myself, which is 
if the situation in Rakhine State is not properly addressed, this might compromise the transition towards democracy. We need to think about that. Is that true? Member states of the United Nations doesn't really feel like that. They are just saying that. This might compromise the, 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 the transition towards democracy. That's not true for them. They are still engaging with the government and they are just citing this formula, please do something because then the transition might be co compromised. I don't, I'm not sure that this is really true. The international community might continue endorsing the transition and the situation in Rakhine State can worsen it. First, second, second. Um, we are in the eve of, of the 2015 election. And one thing that the uh, civil society can do, and the international community in particular, is to try to combat the political speculation that we see that is taking place in Myanmar in terms of uh, um, promoting uh, hate, hate, hatred among communities, uh, religious. Uh, the international community should talk to the candidates for the presidency and ask them, what will be your stance in respect to Rohingya and to Rakhine State? We want to hear you. We don't want you to avoid this issue. There's going to be a change in the government, even if it is superficial, but there are going to be new people there. We would like to listen to you, including Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD. Um, I think um, in the interest of time, we're going to close the discussion, but we will take two questions from the floor because we don't want you to feel you don't have a chance to raise any questions. But keep your questions very short, and then we will keep our, or like they will keep uh, their questions short. And then right after that, we rush out, get on the bus, please. <laughs> Thank you. Now we understand that this is a genocide, according to Penny Green and uh, Tom's already. Now, how one genocide is going, whether in the process or whether in the middle or whatever it may be, how do, who will be going to protect these people? Since these people become defenseless and uh, there is no, I mean, the, for them there is no domestic protection or national protection. In the absence of this national protection, who, whose responsibility is it to protect these people? Thank you. We'll, we'll take another question and then answer them together. And then come. Come on. Come on, yeah. Now, <coughs> oh, I want to know a question. Mm, now I'm uh, 50, 57 years old. My age is 57 years old. Um, <clears throat> I never heard the word genocide in, in our country. Um, and then uh, I never, I never accept the word majority people or majority people and <clears throat> the, the majority suppressing or oppressing the, the, the majority is oppressing the uh, minority. Uh, yeah. he, the, the, he never accepted when 27 years ago. And no, 57 years ago. 57. He has never heard of the word um, ethnic cleansing or genocide uh, in, in his 57 years of life. Yeah. Um, I had never seen with my own eyes um, that the, Bur the majority Burmese are oppressing or discriminating the, uh, the minority. Yeah. 
di boda mada maga di meda gruna muri dasura siya di di luda cenye mesura ne bono di tris hani ramam um, da di burma is a predominantly buddhist country and in 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 our tradition you know let alone harming or taking humans live we're not even supposed to harm uh, you know other life forms that's why the, a, a lot of uh, animals or pets that are in the um, in the homes of the Buddhists generally are um, treated humanely so th thank you very much that's that's his comment Okay, well now uh, we are closing the morning session here and uh, thank you so very much for coming and also being yeah. so patient with us. Do you want to have a last yeah. word? No, not the last word, but it is interesting what uh, Reverend is saying. Yeah. People from Myanmar is peaceful. I visited the country many times and people from Myanmar is peaceful. Okay. Gen genocide question. Yeah, it's peaceful and what are we talking here is what is the responsibility of the government, not the people of Myanmar? And what I say is that the verb destroy, which is in the Convention Against Genocide, should be discussed in respect of Rohingya, whether it is taking place or not. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and what I would, in terms of answering your question, Nur Islam, that I think the protection of the Rohingya must come from inside Burma, ultimately. It, we can't simply rely on the international community. But I do think that means brave people inside Burma, Myanmar, standing up and saying, I'm a Rohingya, I'm going to look out for the Rohingya. And I would, I would call on human rights activists inside the country to do exactly that, because that is the, going to be the protection, the best protection for the Rohingya. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't forget anything, uh, any of your belongings. There will be three buses out.